Around 200 BCE, a boy named Jia Yi was born in Luoyang, a city on the banks of the Yellow River in the north, and recognised as one of the four ancient capitals of China. He grew up in China in a fundamentally different period from that a few decades earlier, a China now united under the rule of an emperor. This political situation had been established by Qin Shi Huang, the founder of the Qin dynasty, which had only lasted as long as his own rule. Now ascendant were the Han dynasty, who had toppled the Qin and now ruled the land. Early in his life, Jia Yi was recognised for his ability to recite the Chinese classics. This led to him being selected by a local official and prominent legalist as a member of his staff, from which he eventually rose to prominence in the court of Emperor Wen. However, he got into factional fights with an old guard element within the court which saw him exiled. However, despite being outmaneuvered by his rivals, the brilliant official and writer was eventually brought back to the court as the tutor of the emperor's youngest and favourite son. However, this position turned out to be one which would break Jia Yi. The young student died in a horse accident a few years after Jia's return, and it said that Jia blamed himself and died a few years later. It has been argued that his death was a suicide due to the guilt that he felt, although this point is hotly contested. Jia was a prolific author. He is probably best known as one of the earliest and most famous composers of Fu Rhapsodies, a form of rhyming written artistic work that falls somewhere between a poem and a prose, generally focused on a place, object or feeling, which is then described and rhapsodized, meaning to speak or write about with someone or something with great enthusiasm and delight. Two of these works survived to modern times, the first called On the Owl, which discusses fate, and the second called Lament for Chu Yuan, where Jia compares his exile to that of an earlier great poet within the Chinese tradition. Jia Yi was also a great essayist, and it is in these works that his philosophical and political work comes down to us today. Perhaps the most famous of these essays is called The Faults of the Qin, where Jia Yi discusses why the Qin dynasty fell after rising to such prominence only a generation before. This is supplemented by a collection of essays called the Xin Shu, which can be translated as something along the lines of New Edition, suggesting perhaps a collation and redaction by later writers, a point of controversy amongst Sinologists, some of who doubt the authenticity of this text. However, when taken together, these texts appear to provide a relatively holistic and synthesised form of thought, and as such, I will refer to both texts throughout this video while I attempt to describe Jia Yi's thought. Jia Yi was born into a world shaped by the recent conquests and establishment of the first true empire under the Qin, which although short-lived, had moulded the role of how the emperor should act and what the empire was understood as. The first and only Qin monarch, Qi Huang, had established a universal and autocratic state. All within the six directions is the territory of the emperor. Wherever human tracks reach, all are his vassals. Jia Yi accepted this standard of universality of imperial rule, theoretically applying to all of humanity. He states, In the ancient proper sense, only when all those to the east and west, north and south, everywhere a boat or cart can attain or human tracks reach, have submitted, can one speak of a son of heaven. After virtue is thick in him and beneficence deep in him, he may be called D. After nobility, it is also added to thereafter, he may be called Huang. By dissecting the term of emperor, Huang Di, Jia Yi asserts that the emperor's domain encompasses everywhere, but is also moderating the amoral, as in the anti-Confucian moralist position of the Qin. It is this moderation of Qin legalist absolutism that marks Jia's theory. Of all the ideas that Jia Yi put forward, the one which has resonated most fiercely through the ages is the concept of people as root. On its face, it appears to be an assertion of the primacy of the population, seemingly in contrast with the Qin despotism. To quote, The country's security or peril depends upon the people. The lord's majesty or disgrace depends upon the people. 
and officials' esteem or abasement depends on the people. The country's preservation or destruction depends on the people. Even more forcibly, he states, If a ruler but turns his back on the way and forsakes duty, repudiates reverence and prudence, and is arrogant and profligate in his actions, then the people of the realm will leave him as if he has died. Their renunciation of him, although not agreed upon, will be as if by appointment. However, by this, Jai isn't taking the position of some proto-democrat, liberal or Marxist. For Jia, people aren't necessarily good. In fact, he can be quite disparaging of the masses that he described as, quote-unquote, those of cloth dress. An example of what the people could do to the ruler was apparent to Jia Yi in the form of Chen She, the rebel who had started the revolt which had dethroned the Qin and elevated the Han. Jia was at pains to highlight Chen's poverty, the ignoble nature of his birth, and even his lack of skill in military art. But once this individual whose, quote, ability did not reach that of a mediocre man, unquote, rebelled, the realm rose up against the Qin and consigned them to the dustbin of history. Jia Yi's point here is that the right or wrong situation can mean that even the lowest and least talented member of the underclass could topple the emperor and the empire, despite lacking the prerequisites for military success in any other circumstance. Jia didn't necessarily see the masses as good, but he definitely saw them as potent. So what were the conditions which allowed Chen She to arise? Well, according to Jia Yi, the Qin rulers made penalties many and punishments severe. The officer's handling of cases was harsh to an extreme. Rewards and punishment were not appropriate and taxation lacked proper measure. Then the licentiousness and the false arose together and the superior and the subordinate deceived each other. Those who bore chastisement were many and the punished and those going to execution gazed at each other in the streets and the realm suffered from it. Jad didn't see this as a one-off occurrence and warned that, just as governmental failures created the necessary conditions for rebellion to occur under the chin, the same circumstances could happen again under the hand. To quote, The cart tracks of the Qin dynasty's quick demise can be seen. If we nevertheless do not avoid them, then the following cart is also going to flip. The alternation between the preservation and destruction, the crux of order and chaos, the essence lies in this. Jia clearly thought that the people were a threat to the regime, or at least an emperor would never be truly able to overcome the dormant potency of the population. But what advice did he give to future rulers as how to harness this sleeping giant? To quote, The population is utterly base, but given the, that one chooses officers from among them, one must select those that they cherish. It follows that one whom ten people cherish and gives allegiance to is an officer for governing ten people. One whom a hundred people cherish and give allegiance to is an officer for a hundred people. And one whom a thousand people cherish and give allegiance to is an officer for a thousand people. And one whom a myriad of people cherish and give allegiance to is an officer for a myriad of people. It follows that one selects high ministers from among the officers for myriad people. This advice, on the face of it, appears to draw somewhat from the Mozart idea of meritocracy, but bends it with a slight populist twist. In some ways, perhaps, it would be better to see Jia Yi as drawing from legalist pragmatism, healthily chastised by the recent example of rebellion and state collapse. Jia Yi's thought showed the Han reaction to Qin legalism, but what is difficult is then placing exactly where Jia sits within the Chinese intellectual tradition. One position that he's been placed in is that of a syncretic thinker of the Huang Lao school, a tradition that drew on legalism, Taoism, and other syncretic texts such as the Shitsi or the Lu Shi Chung Kui. This explains the moderated yet still active influence of legalism in his political essays. This eclectic tradition is also argued to represent the early roots of the religious Taoist tradition, and in his Fu Rhapsodies, perhaps we can see some of these themes present. In On the Owl, fate 
is unpredictable, and none knows what the end will be. Water forced will spurt out. An arrow drawn taut will fly far. Nature is a ceaseless cycle, with everything transmuted, interacting. Clouds gather and rain falls, endless the universal evolution. None can fathom heaven or make plans for the future. Who knows how soon or late he must meet his fate. Although Huang Lao would be influential as a tradition in the early Han dynasty and religious Taoism would remain a potent force through to this day, the tradition slowly gave way in the halls of the powerful to the Confucian ethics and philosophy which would become heavily associated with Han rule. Yet, Jia Yi's criticism of the Qin would remain influential throughout later Chinese imperial history, with the faults of the Qin colouring Chinese interpretations of early imperial history for centuries to come.